This program is being presented to you by the Heraeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. Welcome back to the second tutorial of the WE Heraeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. Now we will deal with topological manifolds. The first exercise is again a multiple choice exercise with three questions. Again, we shall tick the correct ones, and, but not the incorrect ones. So, part A. Topological manifolds, of course, have integer dimension. This is correct. Topological manifolds are equipped with a topology and exactly one shard. No, that is not correct. Topological manifolds are equipped with a topology, of course, but they can be equipped with more than one shard. They are a special case of topological spaces. Yes, they are. Topological manifolds or are or also every topological manifold is a topological space, but not every topological space is a topological manifold. So yes, a topological manifold is a special case of a topological space. Topological space are the minimal structure required to define continuity of maps. No, this is not correct. Continuity of maps can already be checked on topological spaces. And the last question or the last answer says that topological manifolds are homeomorphic to RD. Now we have to, to define what a homeomorphism is. A homeomorphism well, let's better say two spaces M and N are called homeomorphic if there is a bijection x from m to n where the map x as well as its inverse are both continuous. So in the case of a topological manifold, there are such homomorphisms, homeomorphisms, sorry, between the topological space underlying and RD. However, the answer says that a topological manifold is homeomorphic to the whole of RD. Well, that is not correct. We have that a, that a, the part of a topological manifold, namely an open subset, is homeomorphic to some part of RD. So, this is not correct as a topological manifold is usually not homeomorphic to whole of RD. However, we could say a topological manifold is locally homeomorphic to RD. In part B, it says which statements about topological manifolds are correct. Any topological manifold has a maximal atlas. Yes, it does. So, a topological manifold comes equipped with some atlas. And there's a unique and there's a theorem that says you can uniquely build from any atlas a maximal atlas. So this answer is correct. A maximal atlas on a topological manifold may contain infinitely many charts. Yes, of course, it may contain infinitely many. Continuity of a curve on a topological manifold can be checked with respect to an atlas. Well, yes, it can be checked. We saw this in the lecture. 
An atlas of a topological manifold can never contain only one chart. But this statement is nonsense. Of course, it can contain only one chart, and we will see an example for that later on. And the last part, and the last question, if a function is continuous in one chart, it is continuous in every chart of a maximal atlas of a topological manifold. Although this question is a little bit ambiguous, this is correct. So we look at the function that's continuous in one chart and then we look at another chart that has overlap with the original chart. And there we know that due to the composition of continuous maps being continuous, the function is also continuous in this other chart. And then we can look at even more overlaps with more charts and we see that the function is continuous in all charts of a maximal atlas, but we need to restrict ourselves to charts that overlap each other. And the last question here, C, it is correct that the real line R, equipped with a standard topology and an atlas, whose only chart is the identity map over the topological space R, is a topological manifold of dimension 1. This is correct. So this is an example for, a, for an atlas of a topological manifold that contains exactly one chart. A topological manifold can have a finite set underlying. No, this is wrong. We saw that the topological manifold is locally homeomorphic to Rd, so it looks like, it locally looks like some part of Rd. However, Rd and all its subsets are uncountably. However, a finite set cannot look like something uncountably. So, this is wrong. A topological manifold can never have a topology that is a subset topology. Well, this is pure nonsense. We saw many examples in the lecture where there was a subset topology and on a topological manifold. The topological space S42, which is the 42-dimensional 42, 42 sphere, we cannot build an atlas for it. Well, of course we can. So there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to do so. So, wrong. And the last answer, a function from some m to r can only be said to be continuous if m is a topological manifold. Well, that is also not correct, since continuity or can already be checked on a topological space. We don't need the notion of a topological manifold, therefore. So, this was the first exercise. Some questions about topological manifolds. And now, we go to the second exercise. We look at the Möbius River. And one we want, we look at the Möbius strip. You can see it here, which has a river printed on. And from this Möbius strip, which is our manifold, we want to build an atlas. So, let's look at the Möbius strip. So, a Möbius strip 
can be decomposed on paper in this way. That means we identify this edge running from top to bottom here, this way, with the other edge, but here the other way around, from bottom to the top. That's how we can construct a Möbius strip. And now we have a river flowing on it. So, imagine this is just some river. And now, let's look at charts for this Möbius strip. So, we need, we cannot cover the Möbius strip with one chart, we need two. So we can choose this here. which has this domain. We call this the domain U1. And we have another chart here that has this domain, we call it U2, and you clearly see you have overlap here as well as here. And now, how does this Möbius strip look like in the chart? So, for domain U1, we find some chart x that maps u1 to r2 or some part of r2 actually. So this is some part of r2 and the Möbius strip with the Möbius river printed on it looks for example, like this. And the other chart, which has domain U2, we call it Y, also maps to some part R2. So, and in the chart, the Möbius River looks, for example, like this. So we constructed two charts for the Möbius strip and the collection of this chart together with this chart then forms an atlas for the Möbius strip, equipped with a Möbius river. In the next exercise, exercise 3, we will consider the other way round. We now are given an atlas and we want to form the corresponding manifold. So we have four charts that I've also got here. Now we need to find the overlaps in these charts. We can, for example, see, it, see that here we got overlap. Then also we can add this chart here. And the fourth chart can be put here.
And now we have found the overlaps of these four charts. And what do we see? We got overlap down here and up here, as well as overlap here on the left with here on the right. So, what we have is a map that is identified here. So, this edge identified with this edge in the same orientation, as well as here, bottom and top are identified in the same direction. And what we get is a torus, the T2. So what we got for our manifold is a torus equipped with some charts. We have now built a manifold from an atlas as well as an atlas from a manifold. And in the last exercise, which is called before the invention of the wheel, we look at an, another example of a topological manifold. So, Let's consider the set F1 that is, consists of the pairs of real numbers M and N that satisfy the condition M to the power of 4 plus N to the power of 4 is equal to 1. It is equipped with a subset topology inherited from the standard topology on R2. So we look at a map F1 to R that maps a pair in F1 to its first entry. We wish to write this down in formal mathematical terms. So, we have the map X that maps from F1 but not into the real numbers as a whole but only into subset minus 1 to 1 with minus 1 and 1 included. And it takes such a pair M and N and maps it to its first entry which is M. So is this map injective? Well, it isn't. So let's look at the image of the pair 0, 1 under x, well, we map it to the first entry, that is 0, and if we now look at the image of the pair 0, minus 1, it also gets mapped to 0. So, with this map we hit the 0 in the target twice. This violates injectivity, thus x is not injective. However, this map X can be made injective if we restrict its domain to either of two maximal open subsets of F1. Okay, let's do this. So, we call this restricted map now x arrow up and the restriction now is the set of all these pairs m and n of r2 that of course still fulfill the condition that m to the power of 4 plus n to the power of 4 is equal to 1 but now we restrict ourselves to pairs whose second entry is larger than zero. 
By excluding the equal sign, we ensure that, this, that the resulting domain is such an open set as required in the question. And of course, still, we map to the interval minus 1 to 1. However, this is now the open interval as the borders are excluded. And such pairs, M and N, are still mapped to a first entry M. The second map, X arrowed down, as we call it, is constructed accordingly. We take, again, pairs Mn from R2, fulfilling our condition m to the power of 4 plus n to the power of 4 is 1, and n is now smaller than 0. The target is again the open set from minus 1 to 1, and the pair still gets mapped to the first entry, m. And now we see this map here is clearly injective. Now we can construct an injective map, y arrow up, from f1 to r, that maps every pair in a maximal open subset of f1 to the second entry of the pair. So let's construct it. y arrow up. We have to restrict our domain to a subset of f1 for y arrow up to be injective. So we can pick M and N, a pair, in R2 with our usual condition from F1. And now we say we have the first entry M larger than 0. And we still map in the target minus 1 to 1. And now we take such a pair M and N and map it to the first entry. Sorry. Of course, to so the second entry, n. This map is injective. And now we can work with it. Is it invertible? Well, yes, it is. So we see intervals injective. As well, as we can easily check that it is surjective, which means then y arrow up is bijective and the inverse y arrow up inverse exists. How can we construct this inverse? That's not particularly difficult. So now the domain of the inverse was, is the target of the map, of the old map. So the real interval from minus 1 to 1, which is open, gets mapped to the old domain, which is now the target. Get mn in R2, fulfilling the usual condition. And we have that m is larger than 0. So we take some real number a in the interval minus 1 to 1 and it gets mapped to a in the second entry and for the condition m to the power of 4 plus n to the power of 4 is equal to 1. For this to hold we need here the fourth root of 1 minus a to the power of 4. This is the inverse map, y arrow up inverse. And now we look at a possible overlap of the domains of the map x arrow up and y arrow up. Well, there is overlap. And it is the set m and n in R2 that of course fulfill our usual 
condition m to the power of 4 plus n to the power of 4 is 1. But now we have that m is larger than 0 as well as n is larger than 0. And now we are asked to construct the transition map x arrow up after y arrow up. Of course we can only construct this transition map on the overlap of x arrow up and y arrow up. And if we now remember where x arrow up and y arrow up map in this with this domain we see that the domain of the transition map is the real interval from 0 to 1 and we map it to the interval 0 to 1. All intervals are open here and we take some number s, real number s from this interval and it first gets mapped to x arrow up of y arrow up inverse of s. So this is x arrow up of the pair, the fourth root of 1 minus s to the power 4 and s here. We constructed this explicitly in the, in the question before. And x arrow up projected out the first entry of this pair and this is the fourth root 1 of 1 minus s to the power of 4. We see that this is clearly a number in the interval 0 to 1. And thus we have constructed the transition map x arrow up after y arrow up inverse. And the last question is how many maps constructed this way do you need for the domains to cover the whole set f1? Well, we saw that the domain of y arrow up, of x arrow up and x arrow down, they covered f1 without the pairs 1, 0 and minus 1, 0. y arrow up and we can analogously construct y arrow down. They cover f1 without the points 0, 1 and 0, minus 1. So we need four maps, x arrow up, x arrow down, y arrow up and y arrow down to cover f1. And of course the collection of the domains of these four maps and the maps itself form an atlas on f1. And thus we have seen, we have constructed an atlas for our set F1 and we could and we can see that F1 is a topological manifold of dimension 1.